Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. We are almost at the end of uh, this uh, meeting, and always nice to see you all. Well, my name is uh, Marco Polizzi. Uh, I was usually in the background. Nobody sees me, but uh, tonight, um, well, this afternoon, we'll talk about the metaverse uh, and the impact on the protected healthcare um, uh, information. Um, I'm going to talk about this because I have a, a odd background. Besides being a former CVOR director, I had the privilege to also uh, work with uh, with the FBI, particularly for the healthcare information security and also other uh, issues regarding the protection of, uh, protection of the healthcare and private information as well. So about 20 years ago, when I was participating in a study with the National Lewis University in Chicago, we were wondering about how are we were going to serve the population in rural areas, and what was the connectivity that we had available at that time. As you can see here on the population in 2004, we were about 2.7 billion users of the internet, but also the quality of the connection, actually, you know, like today, for example, if the Wi-Fi does not work or if you do, do not have uh, uh, like telephone connectivity, it would have been a true disaster to serve those populations living in very remote areas. But also, what kind of a protection we were gonna give to the information shared, even remotely, such as like populations that lived uh, in Alaska, for example, and uh, how we were going to protect this information. So, 20 years after, in now present time, uh, definitely we'll see a big change in the users of the information. Not only we have now a, 8.6 billion users of the internet, but also the information shared throughout the network and definitely uh, went up tremendously. And that definitely started to, uh, you know, change even more in the recent times when we were gonna use the metaverse. So what is the metaverse? It's not just actually, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence that we may use for gaming, for example. Actually, now we can use the artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and virtual reality to actually help out not only better serve the population in the healthcare industry, but also give us an additional tools uh, under our belt how to actually uh, augment or and improve the healthcare delivery, particularly in the high technological areas such as the uh, uh, cardiovascular world. The compound annual growth rate is actually the algorithms and the extrapolation of how much this technology will be used in the healthcare environment. Therefore, uh, we can see a tremendous, tremendous amount of, uh, you know, uh, hung, I mean, uh, uh, need of this type of technology to actually be part of the uh, continuous uh, imp imp implementations and uh, progress of the healthcare delivery. But that also uh, uh, translates in how much money this will generate to many of those organizations and industries developing uh, this type of technology. Uh, it's like in, in the OR, when they use like a simple tray of uh, surgical instruments, you have different type of qualities. Is it something actually that is reliable, that actually works well? Or is it the cheaper version that will do the job but may fail and perhaps even perhaps uh, provide uh, or um, augment also the uh, uh, the lesser uh, you know quality of care delivered. Same thing also with the uh, intelligence uh, and the artificial intelligence that we may see. So therefore, when we have this uh, uh, technology such as like the three D uh, you know training for our uh, technicians and uh, also perfusions for, for example, hard lung machine uh, usage or any type of high-tech environment, such as like a, even a high-tech uh, delivery, we actually have some programs already available that actually will train and uh, allow the uh, clinician to use this technology before they touch the patient. But how reliable is this type of technology? Because again, as we mentioned before, sometimes we may have a very grayish uh, you know, definition of what exactly uh, this uh, program is, and is it a actually, um, you know, uh, scrutinized like a, a medication would be with the FDA, for example, or any type of uh, uh, instrumentation. This digital technology sometimes is actually still lives 
in a very gray area. And therefore, we may have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, grade of qualities uh, of those uh, you know, type of uh, you know, programs that may be available. Therefore, we have actually uh, different trends. As I mentioned before, uh, cloud computing, particularly when uh, we went from uh, the paper goods type of uh, uh, electronic medical records into the, uh, you know, totally electronic, um, to the electronic medical systems. Cloud computing um, securities in the background to find out exactly if this information that has been shared among, you know, a large population of clinicians, if actually that was reliable to maintain the privacy and the security of the information in the background, including also remote training of uh, clinicians through this technology. Uh, for example, if any of you have ever used uh, the, the Da Vinci uh, type of uh, implementations, it is extremely you know, high tech, it has been proven that can improve tremendously the health uh, of the, the patients by using a remote surgeon's assistance to a local surgeon with that particular robot. But what if have like an interruption of the signal or compromise or lesser quality, um, you know, of the imaging that we may see from a remote area into the local area. So all that, virtual reality, telemedicine and all that, it's all good and dandy, but I can imagine uh, if any of us right here, uh, how many of you have more than one device uh, with you right now in this room? Okay. What if suddenly we don't have Wi-Fi and connectivity? Is it any abuse of you, right? What if we are actually running out of power altogether? We can have, you know, technologies that can baffle the minds, but if we don't have the power or the reliability or the actual source of the information necessary to do and operate those devices, actually, that actually, it's no good. Therefore, we still have to pay attention of the metaverse challenges in healthcare as the privacy and data security, the ethical considerations. No long ago, uh, I'm from Italy, as you can hear from the accent. Uh, we actually had a couple of physicians that actually got uh, sued and actually even uh, incarcerated afterwards because they started by using AI as a augmented tools for them to actually practice medicine. And then they became lazy and they just let the algorithm do their work instead of them double checking if what this uh, program was suggesting them to do as a healthcare delivery. And therefore, mortality did occur, and uh, they actually figured out that this individual's 100% was letting the machine do the work for him. So therefore, the ethical implementation of this technology can definitely change the prospect. How are we going to be a, a baseline clinician versus a, a clinicians that can use this technology to uh, actually help them to improve the health and the recovery of a patient. Technology barrier, as I mentioned before, if you live in the area such as like Central Africa or in the very remote areas in uh, like uh, in Siberia, regardless of the geographical locations or political ideals that you may have in the area, if that technology now it is bare, uh, you know, stopped or restricted because of political or social economics uh, issues. That also can be uh, a, a, you know, a, a question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we gonna offer that technology, but is it available where actually we are going to deliver or use this technology? Um, inclusivity and accessibility. We always have a caste in our society. Man will be man. We're going to have an individual that will be entitled because they have the means and the resources and the monies to do so. And then we have also the areas where we don't have that. If many of us have been through to uh, mission, medical missions uh, operations, and we find out how much different it is, are we going to use like uh, the state of the art S5, you know, in like we use at the hospital? Or are we going to use like a SANS 8000 and hand crank most of the case because there is no power? available in that particular moment. Right there also the, uh, the limitations that this high level of technology may give us depends on the socioeconomics that we may find ourselves. So that also needs to be taken into consideration before saying blindly, we're gonna uh, implement that type of technology 
but what is the actual realizations in real life day-to-day -day operations uh, will be like. Therefore, the, today, um, with this high technology and this uh, uh, great availability through the cloud computing and accessibilities, we also augment the probability that this information will be compromised by cyber attacks as well. After the technology actually augmented and we actually went to the 5G uh, technology or the, um, the augmented technology such as like the uh, uh, AI implementations, we actually Do not appropriate uh, cybersecurity and privacy implementations uh, done. They decide to use the technology. Actually, we will be of the design of the. the recovery of the patients hospitals. Uh, increased mortality rates because of misinterpretation of the data or perhaps poor quality data. Uh, a quick case that comes to mind is this radiologist that was actually sent uh, a, a actually a x-ray through the internet and when he actually did his uh, remote consulting of this chest x-ray consulting he said the patient is fine he may have maybe some lesions on the left uh, lung as a matter of fact, because of the poor quality and poor bandwidth that he had in that particular hospital, he had like a, just like an old telephone cable instead of a Cat5 or fiber optic communications. He actually had missed the lesion of that particular patient and a few months later actually died because of misdiagnosed cancer of that lung. And that also is good. So as I mentioned again, Let's have the wonderful technology that help us out, but let's make sure also that we use the technology in the appropriate manner as well. Then we have also the legality, the compliance aspect. Of course, here, the, the main one will be HIPAA, and we've been bombarded by years how we have to be compliant with the HIPAA uh, information protection. But that also will means that uh, if we need to protect appropriately the names, private data, uh, social security number and all those private informations that would directly, uh, uh, you know, relate to the patients. We have to make sure that we have the appropriate cyber security implementation, including some of us that may actually use uh, mobile devices uh, for charting. When we do a case, we have a tablet and we have like a, just a, a personal EMR system, and then we upload uh, to the hospital system. What kind of security do we have? Are we in compliance with that? Because even if we do our work clinically appropriately and we do the appropriate charting, how safe is this information that we are sharing now into a wireless system? So that's why HIPAA also will actually uh, re uh, request to any of us to have a, at least a reasonable amount of privacy and security implementations in the background uh, EMR systems. Then we have to make sure that we understand again the implementations or the, the concerns about the ethical, uh, as I mentioned before. Do we actually uh, protect the privacy of the patients? Do we mitigate the bias? And, uh, and some organizations had been fine because they were saying, uh, and that without mentioning any names of the organizations that they were uh, saying that only uh, you know, local individuals could be treated in their environment uh, by using an AI system and not the migrant workers or not the uh, individuals that were not insured, for example. So if someone uh, came to, to your hospital without insurance, automatically they were denying them the services of this type of high level quality. And that actually has been documented. Those hospitals will not go to the president, hey, by the way, I'm the one, yep. I just denied the access. It happens. They rather pay the fines and having those administrative fees to be paid than actually uh, use that technology to lesser 
uh, you know, privileged individuals. And therefore, automatically, it will translate to legal actions that may occur in the background as well. So, even for ourselves, if we are using, uh, you know, AI technology or simply uh, our internet, we have to make sure that we have to pay attention how to, uh, you know, properly provide, uh, you know, the cybersecurity for our own protection, but also for our clients and patients. And that can be just by early detection. Many of the uh, even basic laptops that we may have, especially if we are using it for clinical purposes, make sure, let's make sure that we have the appropriate firewall that we do actually uh, upgrade uh, in, uh, you know, um, the, the, uh, the security protocols that may be available, uh, that we use the appropriate browsers in, in, uh, in search engine as well. And, uh, and another thing is awareness and education. Same as we will do for our clinical practice. If we have a new piece of equipment, we are aware that this piece of equipment is there, but also we get educated. Same thing also for the use of day-to-day -day operations uh, for your cell phones, for whatever reason that you may need also in the healthcare environment as well. And yes, the uh, security is actually a, the, uh, a shared responsibility. Any one of us is responsible. It doesn't matter who you are. You may be a housekeeper all the way up to the uh, CEO of an organization. So all of us need to be aware that by using this technology, it is fantastic. However, we have to make sure that we actually using it in the appropriate manner. The next couple of slides, it is just to let you know, uh, besides the, you know, rambling things about the AI technology and all that, but what's happening in real life. Um, I was part of a, a team to, that was investigating the physical security of hospitals. And sometimes that's where it started, because you may have, you know, the most state-of-the-art technology, but if you leave uh, the, the door wide open, someone can go in and actually compromise the physical or even technical security of your environment. And here's the first one. This one here was a orderly that took a picture in the hallway of this hospital, and they thought he was just an electrician doing his work. The blue and uh, red cables actually are Cat5 cable, high-speed uh, cables that actually will actually connect and transfer information from one station to another as a hardwire. And actually, that's the most, the most reliable way to, trans to transfer information because they, they don't have, as we call, air gap. It's not wireless. So the information goes from one PC to a specific other PC. And later on, we found out that those cables that this guy was going in the uh, actual soffit actually went and connected directly to the financial servers of that particular hospital. And we detected afterwards that he was wearing this device. People don't understand. If you don't understand it, you don't ask questions. This guy actually, we found out, and that was one of the investigators that was actually testing. This is to eavesdrop your cable. You just can actually wind uh, against the cable. You can also detect bugs if someone, and that's more on the you know CIA level, uh, if they have microphones, if they have any type of devices that actually, you just put it against a cable, you can actually extract all the information going through uh, that particular uh, line of communication. This one here was one of the most uh, fun one. Anything wrong? Perhaps the first one on the left was uh, a prank from kids. That, that's the loading dock of a hospital. So why did they put this? Was it because something was going on, they didn't want a security guard to see it? In fact, the security guard said, I see a shadow going in front of the camera. So we said, well, you guys go do your rounds. No. The second one right here, I mean, that's the most obvious. Two contractors, no communications from between the two one. The first one installed the camera, and then they put, for, for example, in some ERs in front where you have the, the emergency where the ambulance goes in, you can see, for example, 20 minutes until the next patient to see how efficient they may be. And that was a just kind of propaganda in the, how the schedule was going on in the ER. And they put it just right in front of a camera. No one even reacted to that. Oh, one camera went down, that's it. So did you go and check it out? Uh, no, I kid you not. And, and that was like a 10 years ago. So it's not something that perhaps they didn't understand. And it's quite obvious. 
How about this one here? That was a, a surgery center. This surgery center was built um, here in Florida, and uh, the uh, maintenance guy, and he had the keys of every single room in that particular surgery center, left those keys on the door jam. Uh, on, on, but that's okay, you know. The problem was that each key were labeled which, what door they were opening. So if someone with the malintent actually would have found those keys, I said, okay, safe room, uh, the, you know, the boss office or whatever. So the guy actually literally had the keys of the kingdom and nobody knew it. Believe it or not, uh, we send the, the message or the nurse who sent the message to the administrators, hey, we have some keys. I just left it there. They came to pick it up three days later. Three days later, they stayed there for three days. The next one, uh, that's a, a hospital, brand new, just built. And this is one of the medical rooms where they store medical gases. So they put a wonderful, I mean, look at this, it's still of the art keypad, you know, just stainless steel, but yet with a marker. On the little label, they put the, actually the password to enter. So it was a little bit, and when I asked the, the, the nurse in charge of why, I said, we have so many passwords. I mean, how, how can I get in there and get the uh, O2 tank, you know, in, in a fisherman? So they just did that. So they just they wrote that. How about this one here? Anything wrong? They fixed it. It was actually noticed as, hey, by the way, the chain, and that's the cage around the backup generator for a surgery center. So when we actually ask the maintenance guy, I said, what happened? He said, well, I didn't have my you know, welding gear and all that, so I put the cable tie. It's, it's fixed. I mean, it has a big lock. I mean, that's a beautiful lock, and that's powerful. But uh, they, they just put a zip tie to fix that. And that was discovered about, presumably, a month later that this incident occurred. So many kids could have been, you know, just you know, crazy enough to go there and actually disrupt the uh, you know, backup generator for that surgery center. In all, you know, in conclusions here is that just we have to make sure that to keep our industry secure, regardless of the technology that we'll be implementing, AI, augmented technology, and um, you know, EMRs and what have you, we have to make sure that we have the ab ability to assess where we at all the time, because technology evolves so quickly. We have to make sure that we do have the capability to respond to it. If we don't understand it, let's make sure that we climb up in the chain of command and find out who can actually help us out solve this problem if we don't have that college. And then, of course, monitoring. Each one of us, when we go from the parking lot into our department, if you see something that is odd, that is not supposed to be there, or even, for example, some water on the floor, slip and fall, we need to mitigate the risk that we have in, in our industry from the most simple actions all the way to the high tech. And with that, I will thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you. The question I have is, how do you address the appearance of safety or security of security? Uh, for instance, the last slide you showed with the, the zip tie and the, uh, it would look like an over-the-counter master lock. And that, <clears throat> that master lock, I think, is one of the ones that can be opened up by just whacking it with a rock. Sure. So the zip tie was probably just as secure as that master lock. As I mentioned before, a, a great question, is the awareness, first of all. We need to uh, be aware of what it actually should be, or what it shouldn't be. And on top of that, it's part of the assessment continuously. If, like you said, we can whack just a block, even if the chain was intact, uh, then perhaps it is time to consider if the particular piece of equipment is uh, being compromised, perhaps we need to do it a totally different way. 
Same thing as, as I mentioned before, when we were using the old legacy type of uh, you know, perfusion pump versus the new ones that they are a little bit more reliable. So that also it is part of the evolution of our you know, uh, environment. And of course, um, even like yourself, I said, hey, wait a minute. I saw this on, on the parking lot where I parked. It is a great, valid question to ask your security personnel. Say, do you think that this is actually you know, uh, safe enough? And that's just raise the questions, awareness, and just if you see, like like we said in uh, in law enforcement, if you see something, say something, and that should actually spark the interest of the uh, appropriate individuals, and perhaps we will be able to progress in a particular you know environment. Thank you. Yes, Marco. Thanks. That was an amazing talk, <clears throat> and I think it's very timely. Um, you know, I think a lot of us sit in the audience. A lot of us sit in the audience. That's really loud. And um, <clears throat> it's almost like one of our annual training things. Okay, we got to sit through this. It's the same stuff we've been having learning year after year for as long as we've been doing this. So I think it's appropriate. Also, mention it's cutting out. I think it's also very appropriate to mention that um, within the last two weeks, I want to say one of our major cardiopulmonary vendors had a massive breach. They got hacked and lost patient data. And that's the danger of our new systems. They're all connected through the web, um, web computing, web data storage and such. And uh, I think this is the first breach that we're aware of where we lost cardiac surgery patient data through one of our trusted vendors. And um, I don't know how big of an issue it is, but I'm sure that's gonna send ripples through the industry. Of course, you can imagine, particularly on the law enforcement, thank you for that comment. Um, if something happens, if it's extremely, uh, you know, publicized, then everybody knows it. Usually, those are the cases that they are hushed. Um, a hospital, a case uh, that, that I worked many years ago in Los Angeles, and uh, they actually got three, um, three hacks in, in that particular uh, hospitals within three months. But prior to that, they actually were monitoring, the hackers were monitoring the whole system for two and a half years. We actually have, we had logs that demonstrated that they were just there, patiently monitoring what was going on. And they were basically, they had implanted a Trojan, uh, you know, uh, malware through the interconnection or the lateral vector connection between the air conditioning monitoring company they were doing there and they were just doing monitoring, remote monitoring, monitoring of the air conditioning of this hospital. And, but they had uh, internally a lot of vectors that they had completely no security whatsoever. As a matter of fact, when we saw the server that was compromised, the username was admin, the password was admin. So, and, and we ask why, so, well, that's how the maintenance guy can actually go in and do the maintenance and upgrade the uh, security programs. I said, what kind of security is that when you leave the door wide open? It has no purpose, right? Yes. It sounds daft, but uh, we actually, until very, very recently, had a password that can get you into any hospital system, and the, the, the code was hospital, hospital. Yes. So it's it's not unique, you know, in terms of we have this all over the place. I, I'm just going to read one of the comments that was I am online, which is for anyone interested in the tech. Uh, this was Rosemary Bounce. She recently read a article in Stat News, which highlighted the growing need for AI offices and C suites of hospitals and large healthcare companies. What would you think of that? Is that something th you agree with? In terms of you should have AI offices, uh, you know, in the so high echelons of uh, the hospitals. Again, the AI technology is like any type of tools, right? So if you're a gardener and you have a tool belt and, um, and suddenly you need to embed a nail and you don't have your hammer, it doesn't matter what kind of tools you have in your tool belt. Another thing uh, about the AI, let's make sure that if we are thinking about AI in our environment, is it actually the appropriate tools for what we want to do? Because one of the biggest mistakes that we make, even with the high technology, especially when the hospital starts to go to the cloud system, try to kind of you know, avoid any type of capital purchases with server rooms and so on and so forth. But do they know exactly how to use it appropriately? Do we have the competent and trained and aware staff to use that? 
Same thing with AI as well. It's wonderful, but let's make sure that we actually use the appropriate tool for the appropriate task at hand. Anything else? Thank you.